Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. What we're talking about, for the benefit of our viewers who are probably in the dark, is is a woman that uh, we'll call Katie, who uh, it would appear as if gold leaf just formed uh, around her body. The way it would happen would be sometimes it would just appear instantaneously and spontaneously. Uh, other times her skin would initially glisten a little bit as if um, little droplets were appearing and then suddenly out of those droplets there would be splotches of um, this thin leaf, this mm -hmm. golden colored leaf. And you studied her for a number of years. Yes, for about five years. She was originally, as, as I recall, uh, came to the attention of our mutual friend Dr. Berthold Schwartz. Right. Uh, she lived in Florida not far from Bert's office. And Bert is, was kind of a magnet for psychic subjects of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And he documented Katie's phenomena uh, scrupulously for many years. Mm -hmm. And then you got involved. In, well, in he knew I was interested in macro PK, and he yeah. got in touch with me. And Katie actually did more than just manifest this gold leaf. There were several reasons why I was interested. One was that she was a good all-around psychic. She worked with the police to solve crimes. She could apparently make seeds germinate in her hands, bend metal. Um, and even though she had only a first grade education and was functionally illiterate, when she was in a mediumistic trance, she could write out what looked like quatrains from Nostradamus in medieval French. Now, medieval French, that, that's really, in effect, a case of xenoglossy. Uh, apparently so. Mm -hmm. Not responsive xenoglossy. Someone actually once yeah. tried to speak French to her while she was in trance and that didn't work. Mm. Um, but she couldn't even do more than write her own name in, in English. So this was really quite remarkable. In, indeed. Well, I know one of the issues that became paramount as you began looking at the materializations of, of the gold leaf is whether it was an apport uh, meaning uh, it had come from elsewhere, right. or a materialization formed out of uh, pure air. Right, and that remains a mystery and probably the central mystery about the case, really. Mm -hmm. Because w one of the things I know that you discovered is that this gold leaf looking substance, you had it analyzed numerous times numerous by different times. laboratories. Right. And uh, let's talk about those results. It turns out that the material is actually brass. That means 70% 80% copper, 20% zinc. Um, I've had it analyzed under scanning electric microscopes. I've had it subject to um, the analysis of the Johns Hopkins Material Science Department. Uh, friends at NIST and my home campus of UMBC subjected it to mm -hmm. uh, chemical analytic uh, methods. What, what is NIST? The National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uh -huh, yeah. Where the, one would expect they'd have very good laboratories. Very good laboratories. Yeah. Only limited time to look at the material, as yeah. you can well imagine. Well, you come to a, a, a material scientist and say, can you examine this? They're probably happy to do it. But when they hear the story of how it exudes off of a lady's skin, that, that may put them off a bit. Well, when I went to Johns Hopkins, the material science folks there, they were initially interested in the whole case. Yeah. And I wanted them to take a look and see if there was something conspicuously unusual about the material. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked at it carefully and they determined that it had the same granular, rolled granular structure as the kind of golden colored leaf you can buy in art supply stores. That's a cheap substitute for real gold leaf for uh, gilding picture frames and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. And when they discovered that it was similar or if not identical to the so-called composition leaf or Dutch metal that you could buy commercially, they lost interest. Sure. But not because of the unusual nature of the case, just because as material, as material, it wasn't particularly interesting. Yeah, it would be great <laughs> if it had a unique molecular structure that was never duplicated anywhere else. What bothered me is that they assumed that because it had ordinary molecular structure that 
um, it was probably not paranormal, which is a non sequitur, because presumably something paranormally produced could have normal underlying structure, just as mm -hmm. something that is paranormally uh, produced, uh, rather normally, normally produced, produced, could have an abnormal structure.